time. Today what I will do is introduce to you the next section, 1 Corinthians. We've been studying through that. We took a little, a little break from that to address some other matters. We've come back to that today. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 26 to 33, worship that glorifies God. And this will be part one of that. And Lord willing, we will come back and unpack. But I want you to stand with me if you would. Follow along as I read 1 Corinthians 14, verses 26 to 33. I would remind you, we're in the, in the middle of a section that began in chapter 12 of Paul addressing the abuses at Corinth of the spiritual gifts, of the charismata. He's not left that yet. What he's done is he's built the case, looked at previously. Prophetic utterance, that is, preaching Speaking the word of God is superior to the gift of tongue or to the gift of tongue. He's still dealing with that. Start dealing in this section how they're how they're acting in corporate worship, and that's why we've titled this section here "Worship That Glorifies God." Paul would contend. Follow along as I read. What then, brothers, when you come together, each one has a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. Let all things be done for building up. If any speak in a tongue, let there be only two or at most three, and each in turn, and let someone interpret. But if there's no one to interpret, let each of them keep silent in church, speak to himself and to God. Let two or three prophets speak, and let others weigh what is said. If a revelation is made, to another sitting there, let the first be silent. For you can all prophesy one by one so that all may learn and all may be encouraged. And the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. For God is not a God of confusion, but of peace. What we just read together, the inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient word of God. We want to hear the first words Paul speaks to the people. Be easily overlooked. They are powerful. Thank you. Please be seated. Time that remains. I want us to look at those words. Verse 26. But then, brothers, when you come together, when you come together. Notice he doesn't say, there's a way to say this in the Greek, if you come together. If you happen to find the time, come together. If it should strike you that you remember how well, the believers are meeting, I think we'll go see them today. Oh, no, none of that there. When you come together. Think about this. We could say that Corinth is arguably the most problematic congregation Paul had to deal with in the aftermath of being a significant contributor in the starting of the forming of that planting of that we've we've gotten into 14 chapters here so far and we've covered things like party spirit where they've where they've divided up over different issues even even so far as to divide up over who their favorite preacher has been that they've heard preach there or pastored there all this this controversy on on they've they've winked at immorality in the midst they have taken one another to court they have handled marriage and divorce and remarriage wrong they you just keep they, they get it wrong on liberty and, and so now they get it wrong on the spiritual gifts dealt with that quite extensively and in the face of all of that, it should strike you. Paul does not say, look, with all the problems, Corinth, you guys would be better off to disband. More harm that comes when you meet than, uh, than good things. He doesn't even say, I, I doubt that you're still even meeting, given all the trouble. You. He doesn't. He makes this assertion that reminds me very much of what Jesus said in the Great Commission passage. 
He did not say, deviate from him, he did not say those passages of Matthew and Mark and Luke, John and Acts. You know, I'm going to leave you. I would appreciate it if you would just, if time to time, just try, test out, see, see if there's any merit to this. None of that thing. He says in Matthew, as you go, imperative verb, remember we taught you this, the imperative verb in Matthew is not the verb go. That's a participle. As you go, or going therefore, the imperative verb is on disciple. Make disciples. The verb of command is make disciples. So Jesus had this idea of his followers, his blood-bought followers, for whom he had not, not two months before been nailed to a bloody cross, rising from the grave, he says to them, as you go, make disciples. Jesus had the understanding that his followers would not be still based upon what had happened to them. That the, the, my friend R.F. Gates used to talk to people about salvation. He said, it's like, a, <clears throat> it's like a glove. The glove is sitting there, and the glove has, has, doesn't have any animation to it. You take your hand, and you put that hand into the glove. Suddenly, the glove takes on the appearance of life. Jesus knew that about salvation, transforming grace. Paul is operating under the same idea here. When you come together, Paul assumed that for all that was wrong at Corinth, that they would gather regularly, not conveniently, because in a Roman world that did not recognize Jesus as Lord and certainly did not recognize Jehovah as the exclusive God, in the Roman world where the Christians were more often slaves than not, they did not have command of their own schedules, but they were people from the very beginning who were, who were demonstrated as committed to gathering on the Lord's day. So it strikes me that, that you really can't talk about corporate worship that's what he's going to be doing here. You can't study it and, and, and examine your heart against the apostles' teaching, examine our practice against the apostles' teaching. You cannot do that unless there is a wholesale, sold-out commitment to come together for corporate worship. The rest of what he says is meaningless if there is no coming together. And so I want just to remind you of what we read earlier. We read this passage from Isaiah 58, and, and you may have wondered, what in the, what, where, is, where is this going? Well, we're going to be talking about fasting. He discusses fasting. We're going to talk about that on Sunday nights in our spiritual disciplines study. But what he is basically saying here, God is through the prophet Isaiah, is that you do a lot of things that look like religious things, and you... Don't demonstrate a heart of compassion. That's why you get into the things about caring for people. And he says, is this the fast I have chosen? In other words, don't fast ceremonially uh, as the Pharisees did. Remember Jesus talking about that in the Gospels? So when you fast, you make sure everybody knows it. Long face. How are you doing? I'm fasting. Why? Well, we're commanded to fast. Well, why are you doing it? Well, to Get more righteous. Well, I mean, does that impact your joy at all? I hope so. I mean, it's just, Jesus said the Pharisee. Fast out of church. Out of church. Deny yourself. Serve others. That's what he's going for. And then he gets to this section. He talks about how there's going to be, going to be blessing. Ten, verse 10, if you pour out yourself for the hungry, satisfy the desire of the afflicted, then shall your light rise in the darkness, your gloom be as the noonday. The Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your desire in scorched places and make your bones strong, and you shall be like a water garden. Do you hear the pictures there? You will receive, in transformational grace, you will receive 
the transformation from the inside out, which is what Paul talks about in Romans 12, keep on, keep on being transformed from the inside out. You will receive that in the, in the engagement and execution of mercy, because you've been shown mercy, kindness, compassion. Notice what else happens. Verse 12, and your ancient ruins shall be rebuilt. There, there will be a reformation that will come to any individual, any family, any congregation that takes these things, these evangelical instructions seriously. Your ancient ruins shall be rebuilt. You shall raise up the foundations of many generations. See, we don't, we don't need more spiffy things going on around here to fill up the auditorium. We need a congregation that exists to give itself to these things. You shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of streets to dwell in. And then comes the hammer. If you turn back your foot from the Sabbath, the, the accusation here is you've turned away from the Sabbath. Here's the Sabbath. Here's you. Turned away <clears throat> from doing your pleasure on my holy day, not holy hour, holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight. In other words, you, you're like the psalmist. I was glad when they said unto me, guess what? It's Sunday. Let's go to be with the people of God. Go into the house of the Lord. Holy day of the Lord. Honorable. What's another way for saying holy day of the Lord or day of the Lord? We taught you this when we were studying the Revelation. Lord's day. The day of the Lord is the Lord's day. I can get confirmation of that from our, from our English grammar expert here. If you need that. You back me up, won't you, Georgia? Exactly. All right. Day of the Lord, Lord's Day. If you honor it, not going your own ways, or seeking your own pleasure, or talking idly, then, there's an if then here, you shall take delight in the Lord. So if I just, no, Pastor, I just don't, I'm not as close to the Lord as I used to be. Well, I mean, uh, are you close to the Lord's people on a regular basis? I'm going to tell you something. C.S. Lewis said it first. Heaven will be hell for some people who don't like to be around the Lord's people. That's all that's going to be there other than angels and Jesus and God and the Holy Spirit. You shall take delight in the Lord. I will make you ride on the heights of the earth. In other words, the earth will not drag you down. I will feed you with the heritage of Jacob, your father. What is that? What's the heritage of Jacob, your father? It is his covenant promise. His covenant promise. You will be nurtured in the new covenant. For the mouth of the Lord is spoken. How, how can I be sure of this? I'll tell you something. Joshua said it earlier. Sometimes we have to cultivate dutiful habits. In other words, we do them out of duty first. You brush your teeth out of duty first. But when you get old enough to appreciate a good dental appointment, you brush your teeth with the hope of getting that thumbs up from the dental hygienist. And the dentist follows her in and he says, he picks around a little bit, hurts you a little more, and then says, looks good. That's what you, you want that. Don't you? you don't go to the dentist thinking, I sure hope he finds something to drill on. You hope you get a clean bill of health, right? Well, that's what he's talking about here. The more you, so sometimes you have to do things. You have to make yourself get up and go to Bible study, make yourself come to worship. You say, well, shouldn't you want to? Well, sure you should want to. But when you're not in the want to spot, when the gospel is not operating and feeding your want to, sometimes you need to do what you ought to. And when you do what you ought to long enough, guess what? You want to fix. Worship cannot be discussed meaningfully apart from when you come together. One more passage, and we've got we to wrap this up. We've got to go eat. Hebrews 10, 19 to 31. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, 
by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain. That is, through his, we just celebrated that. Just through his flesh. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, get the preacher. You're drawing near to the great high priest over the house of God. He's not over the woods. He's not, he is Lord over all that, but he's, he's a high priest over the house of God. You, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience. That's new covenant language, folks. Washing, sprinkled clean. Our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. Every person I've ever met who's newly born again is excited, optimistic, hopeful, can't, can't wait to be with the people of God. Uh, you, you know them. You've met them. Open the doors. They fall right in. They're right there, right there waiting, ready to go. You love it. Somehow along the way, life. He says, don't waver. Preach, I've been doing this so long, then you ought to be the best at it. Don't waver. For he who promised is faithful. See, my faithfulness, your faithfulness, should be fed by the reality that the one who promised is himself faithful. Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. Ah, we can do that through Twitter and Facebook Messenger. and There's no better way than when you come together. There's no, not even a close second to that. Not neglecting, he ties these two together. Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. Not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some. And I don't think he was talking about go have coffee together at Starbucks or something. The idea of meeting together is coming together as is the habit of some, so it had already happened, see, but encouraging one another, and all the, more, all the more as you see the day drawing near. What day? Great and mighty and awesome judgment. That is the culmination of all the Lord's days. The day of the Lord, which puts the capstone on all the Lord's days. For if we go on sinning deliberately, that's what he calls cultivating habits that are antithetical growing in grace, sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. That ought to scare the stew out of anybody who reads this seriously. Dear God, don't let me live long enough to get in, become engaged in sinful acts or patterns that would put me in a category that says there is no sacrifice for sin for me. Rather, only a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversary. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. I'm sure glad I'm under grace. Hang on, you hadn't read all this. How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God, who has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has outraged the spirit of grace. In other words, the law of Moses did you in <laughs> sinning against the triune God of the new covenant. It's that stuff. For well, we know him who said, vengeance is mine, I will repent. And again, the Lord will judge his Conclusion? It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. That's true for me, true for you, true for your children, who if you're not setting good habits and examples in terms of modeling for them and then encouraging them to cultivate and develop them, saving. God may save them. He may break in and save them. He's... he's Mighty to save and merciful beyond our understanding. These passages tell us, don't take that. So I'm going to close. I hear something going on this evening that has everybody's attention. So much so that it gets the adjectival descriptive super. 
here. One of the teams has already said, if we win, we're not going to the White House. Take that, America. I hear that the halftime performers, Maroon 5, are going to tip a hat. Colin Kaepernick is kneeling. In other words, what's going to be on display tonight is a very expensive play of sportsmanship, physique, trampling underfoot, many things that you and I hear. And it's going to happen in a city that historically, when, when this, this event shows up in a city, it is the one day of the year, human trafficking, sex trafficking, minors, girls, largest businesses apart from that particular. Now, we don't have anything we promised to be super. Won't be any big halftime. We'll be doing though, looking at Bible most important, the spiritual discipline. Because if you're not taking in the Bible, you're facing butterflies. Anywhere else you're trying to grow in this. Where's your foot going to go, brother? Where are you going to turn your foot? Lord's holy day. And you and him. So where I'm going to be, I was so excited last Sunday. It turned out for the. I'm. I'm, I, I can be even more. I haven't, I haven't hit the top of my excitometer. My excitometer was climbing. Like I pray, seriously, challenge to be conformed to the image of Christ. Let's just live. Good, godly habits, pretending that this day belongs. See, if this day belongs to us, how we think, probably an indicator that we may not. Maybe it's always been trusting in Jesus, crucified, repenting of sin, and being forgiven for sin. Think under the fingernail. Thought. Dear Holy Father, we bow before you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and thank you for this Lord's Day, an opportunity to gather together with my brothers and sisters in Christ to rally around the Lord's table and remember that he gave his body and his blood for our sin. Thank you for giving us in your, in your teaching, in your word, letting us know that one day in seven is to be set aside in, in devotion, praise and worship and service to you along with our brothers and sisters in Christ coming together would be the theme, the norm, the heartbeat as we anticipate the day, the ultimate day of the Lord, which will usher us into an eternity of Lord's days. We repent, Lord, that we get tired worship. We repent that we get tired studying the scriptures. We repent that we get tired of sitting in pews. We repent for all of those things and long for the day when you will take us to be with you and make us like you, and we will never be weary Worship. Worship. Ever. We will worship. Help us take that day seriously by taking this day seriously, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.